What's up everyone? Welcome back to Wait Your Turn. It's been a while, and it's Jordan. So today we're looking at Espoia by Nima Games, an intensely tactical card game that serves two to four players competitively and will potentially unlock a solo and cooperative mode on their Kickstarter campaign right now on Kickstarter. Check out their link below. Before we dive into this preview of what Espoia is, what makes it tick, and a couple of, you know, critiques that I normally have, let me first begin by saying Espoia has already won the Double Lightning Bolt Award from Wait Your Turn. It's that good. It's deep, it's simple, and where it delivers, it delivers in spades, cubes, and cards. I've been impressed, I've been surprised. Without further ado, let's jump into the world, the card game, the board game, Espoia. <laughs> Superficially, Espoia resembles another attempt to surpass Magic the Gathering. However, with its use of tactical positioning, its unique shared mana system, which I consider superior to Magic the Gathering, Espoia pushes past mere imitation and deeper into innovative design. For the purposes of this preview, I will go over a couple of mechanical areas where Espoia absolutely excels offer a couple critiques, and then end with a conclusion as to whether you should back this game. All right, so let's begin with the tactical positioning element that I mentioned previously. In order to actually deal damage to an opposing realm, here's a realm card for this aggressive red faction and the realm card for this rather defensive collaborative human faction. A melee unit has to be physically adjacent, or at least in the next row, to deal damage to the opposing realm. What this creates is a unique system of blocking. If you can get your piece in front of their piece and they don't have enough movement to get around you, they can't deal damage to you. This leads into one of my favorite cards of this game, which is called Wall of Trees. What do you think a Wall of Trees does? It summons five end monsters that can basically stand in a whole row and prevent any monsters from getting through. These trees, which aren't very strong, create an extremely strong line of defense because other monsters can't get through. At the same time, each faction gives you the tools to address and answer the other cards of different factions. For instance, using a flying monster negates a melee unit as effectively as a brick wall. The amount of interactions is staggering and satisfying to discover as you play the game. Each card effectively walks you through its function, and there's there's depth within each card that you can discover, how it works, how it interacts. Even the blank vanilla monsters can be buffed by the other cards. It's very interactive and very enmeshed. Sorry, I got off on a tangent there. The tactical positioning is really good. The fact that a single space can make a huge difference as to whether a unit dies, as whether you get damage in, as to whether your units on the back line where you summon the monsters initially can progress and move forward into a more advantageous position. The tactical elements, even though this is simply a five by five board, is deep and really well done. Another mechanic that distinguishes a spoil from other games <laughs> is its shared mana deck system. While each player has their own separate deck that they build themselves, they both share a single mana deck of cards ranging from random mana based on a single d6 roll or 1 to 5. This just makes sense. It makes sense to separate the mana from the deck. In this game, you have a ton of control over whether you want more cards or whether you need more mana. In addition to this, each player receives five mana automatically and consistently with each turn. If a player needs more mana to play a higher cost card, they can choose to draw from this mana deck blindly rather than drawing from their own personal deck. Consequently, the opening turn is always different. You can play any card almost at any time, depending on whether you're willing to go into the mana deck for more mana versus drawing more cards that could fuel your assault from your own deck. So now there's no longer routine turn one, play this card, turn two, play this card, turn three, play this card. You can play your legendary angel laser cannon turn one if you want, if you draw the right mana card of the right cost. This separation has an even deeper mechanical 
and visceral significance the more you play. But I'll talk about that a little bit more later down in my critiques of the game. As for my next point, Aspoia really allows for some amazing comebacks. When I was playing this really aggressive red deck, which is right here, I dealt 14 damage in the first two turns. I dealt another 3 damage on the third turn, leaving my opponent at 3 hit points on the third turn. My opponent was then able to destroy the remainder of my forces, come back, and win from 3 hit points. It's pretty impressive how this game creates that ability. It gives you the tools to answer even the most dire circumstances. Some cards are able to be played when your realm is at low hit points, and in that case, they can really save you. Ultimately, in my experience, Aspoia rewards good play, thoughtful choices, and even risky ploys. Next up is a mechanic I'm going to call Unit Longevity. As you can see over here, we have a bunch of yellow and red cubes of 1 to 6, and even 7 to 12, and even 13 to 18, to resemble the growing power and health of each card. This game doesn't feel like a simple one-for-one -one trade battle of attrition. In fact, each card can become a huge, massive threat as different supports, other monsters, when they die or when they're placed on the board, can increase the power or increase the health of allied units. A simple 1-1 one -one soldier with no ability can become a powerhouse with the right compounded effects over time. Also, I thought that these would be really fiddly and uh, kind of annoying, but they're really fun to use when you're rubbing in your growing 1-1 one -one soldier into a powerhouse uh, play, and they stay placed really well. You think it'd be kind of unusual for a monster to reach, you know, 12, 13, 15 power when they start at 1, but it's not as uncommon as you'd think, and you can build some crazy monsters. There are many situations in the game where you're like, huh, should I throw three of my monsters to take down one single growing hulk that's coming from my opposing uh, opposing realm side, or should I focus on trying to get as much damage, damage in as I can? So this unit longevity system of growth and change and damage being recorded on each card creates this permanence and impact that I don't I haven't felt in another card game of this tactical element thus far. Now, as we move into my critiques of the game, it was a little difficult to pinpoint actual flaws with the game versus just me getting accustomed and learning the mechanical nuance of a spoya, but one of them comes down to this simple and efficient mana system. One of the main draws of this game is the ability to choose whether to draw cards from this mana deck or to draw cards from your own deck. You can even stockpile mana cards into your own hand, which is very useful and counts towards your 10 card hand limit. However, the more I played and the more I relied on this mana deck, I realized that the more you drew from this, the more likely you were to burn out over the course of a longer game. In fact, it's probably more advantageous to draw as few cards from the mana deck as possible. Naturally, you could homebrew this by drawing two cards per turn instead of one, so you could draw mana and a card from your deck or double cards from your deck to allow for that, but I found that because mana isn't persistent and you discard it immediately once you spend it, it created this interesting tension. Do I really need this mana? Should I risk drawing mana from the deck when it's actually in the long term, more advantageous to keep fuel in your hand from your main deck. Whereas really exploiting this mana deck allows for some extremely explosive turn one plays or even later turn plays, the later the game goes on, the more likely you are to burn out. So in that sense, this system rewards conservative play, not over relying on explosive mana draws. As a result, the random composition of this mana deck combined with the composition of your own deck creates an atmosphere that actually rewards conservative play with a few spikes of risk encouragement. My other critique is more of a gripe and lies within the faction system. As you can see, each card underneath their art, keep in mind this is all placeholder art at the moment, has a faction system below. This one's a shield, that one's a helmet, I think there's another one that's a sword. These faction symbols represent that these cards belong to the same faction and can't be mixed into a deck of a different faction. So you can't mix 
shield factions with helmet factions, and etc, etc. On one hand, I understand that this artificial factionism is meant to keep cards with inherent synergies together and to help the player discover and walk through uh, mechanics that complement each other. Not to mention the narrative aspects of Espoia's canon that uh, is meant to isolate these factions and really tell a story within each faction. I understand that. However, with the use of this mana system and the fact that it's all generic mana, we don't have swamps and forests or plains and islands, every faction can be spent using the same mana system. Splash ability is extremely viable and extremely easy. Um, and the ability to mix and match uh, factions, I feel, should be encouraged. I, I haven't experimented with this personally, but there's nothing stopping you from doing it. It's so tempting. And obviously, I didn't have the time to mix and match every single faction. They sent me one, two, three, four, five, six separate factions with even some bonus cards that'll be unlocked with stretch goals. So those are my only critiques, which are barely critiques. They're just small nitpickings. So... I'm sure we're all wondering, should you back this? Do you enjoy a game with quick setup, easy teardown, that has a huge amount of tactical interplay delivered in a small amount of space and time? Then yes! Are you or have you ever been a fan of Magic the Gathering? This game does the mana system better. Yes! Are you tired of not being able to play your 10 cost monster because it keeps getting countered? This game doesn't have counters. Yes! And finally, do you enjoy a game that jumps straight into high impact, deep action? Then yes. If you answered yes to all those questions, then go check them out on Kickstarter. I'll put the link down in the description below. So that is my Should You Back It review for Espoia. I hope that wasn't too much praise. I was actually, I was pretty blown away. This game's a great game and definitely threw me back to those times where I loved Magic the Gathering. I, I'm sorry I keep making that comparison. This game really, uh, it's, it's really good. So thank you all for watching everyone. Put your comments down below. Are you backing it? Why aren't you? Why are you? And let me know what you think. Subscribe if you haven't already and have a wonderful day everyone. Thank you for watching. Thank you for waiting. Now it's your turn.